الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله إن الطالب للدم لا يصح أن يقيم الحد بل يدخل في الطاعة ويرفع دعواه إلى الحاكم ويطلب الحق عنده ولا يجوز لأحد أن يقتص من أحد ويأخذ حقه دون السلطان أو من نصبه السلطان لهذا الأمر لأن ذلك يفضي إلى الفتنة وإشاعة الفوضى The companions were a people whose deeds, no doubt, due to their unique praiseworthy status, deserve our deliberation. One of the scholars of the companions, Abdullah ibn Masood, said of his fellow disciples, Whosoever of you seeks examples, let him take examples from the companions of the Prophet wasallam, Because amongst this ummah, they had the most righteous of hearts and the deepest knowledge, were the least bit burdened at doing good, and the most upright in guidance, and of the best condition. Allah chose them for the companionship of His Prophet wasallam. so acknowledge their virtues and follow them in their footsteps, for indeed, they were upon the straight guidance. From their virtues is that Allah gave witness to the purity of their Iman and the state of their Islam in the lifetime of His Prophet. That witness was not abrogated following His wasallam's passing, despite the companions falling into civil strife. Our default is to deny oxygen to the awliya of shaitan in their iniquitous insinuations against the sahaba who are the awliya of the most merciful ar-Rahman. As the beloved slave of ar-Rahman, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ordered, إِذَا ذُكِرَ أَصْحَابِي فَمْسِكُوا When my companions are mentioned, withhold. But the slanders are out there. So sometimes some of us have to step up to expose them for what they are and the evil agendas of those who perpetuate and promote them. And this is despite the unpleasantness that we feel in recalling the strife that took so many a life of those who accompanied Allah's Messenger and who will rejoin Him in the afterlife. With that disclaimer being made, and with a heavy heart, let's delve a little deeper into Al-Fitna Al-Kubra, the Great Fitna, the First Fitna. May Allah pardon us. Abu Musa Al-Ashri said, the Prophet ﷺ entered a garden and ordered me to guard its gate. A man came and asked permission to enter. The Prophet ﷺ said, Admit him and give him the glad tidings of paradise. Behold, it was Abu Bakr. Another man came and also asked permission to enter. The Prophet ﷺ said, Admit him and give him glad tidings of paradise. Behold, it was Umar. Then another man came, asking permission to enter. The Prophet ﷺ kept silent for a short while and then said, Admit him and give him glad tidings of entering paradise with a calamity which will befall him. Behold, it was Uthman bin Affan. Uthman's murder was but the first of four acts that punctuate the story of the great fitna. A large mob, the Ghawgha, totaling several thousands of disgruntled individuals from beyond Arabia, had descended upon Medina to bully Uthman into abdicating his khilafahship. None of the Ghawgha's grievances were legitimate, and even had they been, they were nowhere nearing what would warrant such treasonous behavior, and Uthman knew it. The Prophet ﷺ said to Uthman, O Uthman, إن الله عسى أن يلبسك قميصا. فلو أرادك المنافقون على خلعه فلا تخلعه حتى تلقاني. The rest of the companions were incensed and wanted to crush the treacherous insurgents, but Uthman forbade them, even as they lay siege to his home and prevented any food or water reaching him. A token security detail comprising a handful of younger companions standing guard at the door of Uthman's house is the most that the caliph would tolerate, as he didn't want any blood to be shed on his account. Eventually, the insurgents broke in, breaching the skeletal security cordon by climbing over the rooftops. They found Uthman reading from his Mus'haf of the Qur'an. Our Mus'haf, the Qur'an with us today, forever to be referred to as Uthman's Mus'haf, because it was he who canonized it by ordering all non-Qurayshi dialect copies of the Qur'an destroyed. 
a brave and wise order given by the Caliph to ensure people have access to the same uniform reading of Islam's Holy Scripture. One Ummah united upon one reading of the Qur'an. This masterstroke of a policy for preserving scriptural integrity was one of the complaints the mob had against Uthman. Ironic, considering such people were its primary benefactors. One of the rebel intruders struck Uthman radiallahu anhu with a piece of iron, splitting his head open and causing blood to splatter onto the verse, Allah will suffice you against them, and he is all hearing, all knowing. Another rebel severed the caliph's hand as he tried to shield himself from sword strikes. I swear by Allah, Uthman complained, the hand that you have just cut off was the first to write the Quran. Uthman's wife's fingers were then severed as she tried to protect her husband from the murderous ingrate swords, until finally one of them pierced Uthman in the stomach before mounting his bloodied body and repeatedly stabbing him in the chest to death. The Muslims were in a state of shock. Even in Jahiliya, Uthman had been loved due to his high morals, noble character and handsomeness. So much so that mothers would sing to their children, Uhibbuka wa rahman Hubbu Qurayshin li Uthman I love you by the most merciful Allah as the Quraysh love Uthman. In Islam, he was even more beloved as he was loved by Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who had given him in marriage two of his daughters in succession. From the death of one son-in-law of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the mournful Muslims turned to the other, Ali bin Abi Talib. They asked Ali to lead them. Do not, was his reply. That I be minister is better than I be leader. But the people insisted, the good of them as well as the gha. The latter of course for entirely selfish reasons. They reckoned that if they helped secure the caliphate for Ali, they would be securing their own political power and influence. Mob rule in a very real sense. And so, for the greater good, Ali stepped up to become the fourth caliph of Islam. Indeed by Allah, swore the Messenger of Allah, we do not assign this matter of leadership to the one who asks for it, nor to the one who covets it. The senior Sahaba, as one would expect, expected and insisted that the proto kharijites who murdered Uthman be brought to justice. Naturally, Ali agreed. On the need for qisas, retribution, there was unanimity. Indeed, the individual who had dealt the death blow to Uthman, one Saudan bin Hamaran, was executed more or less on the spot. But while, in principle, all the leading companions and their supporters were on the same page. In practice, Ali was finding it almost impossible to single out all the core conspirators. Who from among the rabble that had besieged Uthman's house was actually guilty of regicide, and who was simply caught up in the commotion? Also, how was Ali to bring the multitudes of the mob to task, when many of them had melted away back into the shadows, and others still formed a Praetorian guard around him, stifling him as much as serving him? the same force he would need to enforce his will and justice. Alas, the tragic reality of Ali's predicament was something those pursuing revenge on behalf of Uthman would only later come to appreciate and show sorrow for. A party of believers who included the Prophet's widow, Ummul Mu'mineen, the mother of the believers, Aisha, and among the greatest of the companions, two of the Al-Asharatul Mubashireen Bil Jannah, the ten promised paradise in their lifetime, Talha ibn Ubaidullah, and as Zubair bin al The tripartite power personalities of Aisha, Talha and Zubair met in Mecca and from there set out for Basra in Lower Mesopotamia. They intended by their initiative to pursue those of Uthman's killers who had fled to Iraq and to rally the righteous there to their cause. They genuinely believed that by taking matters into their own hands, demonstrating their strength, they would force Ali's hand and bring about a rectification at length. What moved them in particular to act, especially Talha and Aisha, was the extreme remorse and guilt they felt of Uthman's death. Their personal differences with Uthman during his caliphate prevented them from standing by him in his hour of need. That's perhaps an understatement. And because Arabic is a language of overstatement, we don't want to repeat some historians as claims of the unwitting fanning of flames. What we can say objectively is that the killing of the caliph was the last thing any of the companions wanted. As Hudayfa bin al Yaman said, when news reached him of the murder while he was campaigning far away in the Caucasus, O oh Allah, curse the murderers of Uthman, 
and those who attacked and reviled him. O Allah, indeed we used to reprove him, and he would reprove us, whenever those who were with him reproved us, and we them. But they have taken that as a ladder to rebellion. O Allah, do not let them die except by the sword. Thus a handful of companions overcompensated for their having differed with Uthman during his life by demanding all-out war against those who collectively delivered him to his death. There is for me regards Uthman a thing, Talha reasoned, for which there is for me no penance except that my blood be spilled in seeking revenge for his spilled blood. But even on the approach to Basra, Aisha had sensed the evil that was about to engulf her and that her effectively usurping Ali's right to exact vengeance as he saw fit, and in a manner of his choosing, was not going to give her the redemption she was seeking. As she passed by the oasis of Ho'ab outside of Basra, she was suddenly shook by the din of dogs barking. (laughs) The canines' clamour reminded her of a hadith, when the Prophet ﷺ had said to his wives, What will be the state of one of you? when the dogs of Ho'ab will be barking at you. At that moment, Aisha was overcome with a sense of foreboding. She insisted on turning back, but her travel companions insisted they keep going until they convinced her of the worthiness of their mission. Rather, we continue forward, so the Muslims see you, so that Allah, mighty and majestic, will rectify their affairs. In reference to the ayah, لا خير في كثير من نجواهم إلا من أمر بصدقة أو معروف أو إصلاح بين الناس ومن يفعل ذلك ابتغاء مرضاة الله فسوف نؤتيه أجرا عظيما There is no good in most of their secret talks save the one who orders charity or good or reconciliation between the people. And whosoever does this seeking the good pleasure of Allah, we shall give them a great reward. Dalha Zubair and Aisha did meet with some success, as one of the Basran conspirators, who had Uthman's blood on his hands, was executed upon the tripartite's entry into the city. But the situation was tense and messy. The Basrans were caught between honouring the wishes of these more senior Sahaba, who had now entered their due restriction, and honouring their duty of obedience to the Caliph. When the Basran hosts questioned the visiting companions how they could justify fighting Ali after having given him their bay'ah, Talha explained, I entered the garden in Medina, and a sword was placed upon my neck. It was said to me, Swear allegiance, or we'll kill you. So I swore allegiance while knowing it to be false. Zubair similarly explained his bay'ah to Ali had been involuntary at the threat of death, adding, One of the thieves dragged me until I swore allegiance under duress. But that did not mean these most noble companions did not begin to regret the road to rectification they had taken. Once when Zubair cited the ayah, and fear the fitna which affects not in particular those of you who do wrong. Some people said to him, O father of Abdullah, then why did you come to Basra? Zubair replied, Woe be to you, indeed we see, but we are not patient. Ali had prepared an army to march upon Syria to enforce his writ there, but in light of what was happening in Iraq, he diverted east, camping not far east of Kufa, at a location called Dhaqar. When Ali was asked, Tell me about this march of yours. Is this an order that the Messenger of Allah had given you, or is it an opinion you have? Ali replied, The Messenger of Allah did not give me any order. This is an opinion that I have. For three days, Ali, Talha and Zubair tried to come to terms, but the negotiations proved less than conclusive. The following day, Thursday the 8th of December 656, Fools and youths from both camps began hurling abuse at each other. Then the abuse was swapped for projectiles, each of the two sides sliding as if uncontrollably into conflict. So began the Battle of the Camel, Mawqiyat al-Jamal, so named because Aisha was present in the periphery, seated in her howdaj, an enclosed camel litter canopy atop her decked-out dromedary. It was not no Sahabi, but Satan, shaitans from Insan and Jan, 
who scurried like rats between the believers, conniving and conspiring, and stirring a perfidious pot of fitna, until swords did clash as if against the will of those wielding them. Even then, even during the hostilities, the companions tried desperately to stand their forces down. Dalha rode up and down the battle lines, urging his men to sheath their swords, until an arrow shot by Marwan bin al-Hakam pierced his thigh, severing Talha's sciatic vein near the knee. This is how the brave Talha, who was the Prophet wasallam's human shield during the Battle of Uhud, when he protected Allah's Messenger from arrow shots, spear thrusts and sword strikes alike, ultimately met his tragic end. Dumbai by an arrow that bled out his blessed soul. Ali, always the brilliant general, won the day militarily, but he did not celebrate. Carrying Talha's slain body to his eldest son, Hassan, Ali lamented, How I wish I had died before this day by so many years. When he was later approached by Talha's son, Imran, Ali consoled him, saying, Inshallah your father and I are from those about whom Allah said, ونزعنا ما في صدورهم من غل إخوانا على سرور متقابلين. And we shall remove from their chests any sense of malice. They will be as brothers facing each other on thrones. As for Zubair, when Ibn Abbas confronted him on the battlefield, what would Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib, your mother, say? Allah knows best. But maybe Zubair was also made to remember when the Prophet had said to him in Ali's presence, You will fight him, while you will be in the wrong. Zubair was at once overcome with regret, and left the theatre of war. That night, whilst he was engrossed in his prayer, he was murdered by one of the conspirators. When Ali learnt of Zubair's cold-blooded slaughter, he remarked, Bashir qatila ibn Safiyata bin Nar. Glad tidings of the fire for the killer of the son of Safiyya as he recalled another hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Indeed, for every Prophet there is a disciple, and indeed my disciple is a Zubair. Aisha also tried to explicate the believers from self-ruin. When her camel stumbled and all those who had been flanking it had fallen, another of Talha's sons, Muhammad As-Sajjad, Muhammad the Prostrator, so called due to his prolonged prostrations, came forward crying out, What should I do, O mother? I think you should be as the better of the two sons of Adam, was her advice. So Muhammad the Sajjad threw aside his weapons and defended himself karate, empty-handed, for as long as he could, refusing to kill his brethren in faith, just as Abel had refused to kill Cain until he was martyred. And when they saw his body slain, Ali remarked to his son, Hassan, the elder brother of Hussein, were it not for his dutifulness to his father, his piety and virtue would not have let him go out like this. Muhammad bin Talha's widow, Khawla, would later marry Hassan bin Ali. If Talha's pious son could not defend Aisha's camel, no one else was going to either. Two Kufans cut off the creature's legs, and Ali's loyal lieutenants, Ammar bin Yasir and Muhammad bin Abu Bakr, Aisha's own brother, removed its litter, still containing its precious passenger, away from the theatre of war. Thus concluded the Battle of the Camel. 10,000 dead, 5,000 from each side. As for Aisha, when one of the Kufan camp gloated at her predicament, Ammar bin Yasir scolded him. Oskut maqbuhan mambuha. Shut your mouth. Be ugly and get lost. By Allah, she is the wife of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this world and the hereafter. It is just that Allah has tried you with her to know if you will obey her or obey him. Here again, Ali had a prophecy to help him make sense of it all and to keep matters in perspective. There shall be between you and Aisha an issue, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had told him. 
Me, O Messenger of Allah? queried Ali. Yes, you. Then I am the worst of them, O Messenger of Allah. No, the Prophet replied. But when that happens, return her to her place of safety. And that's exactly what Ali did. Provide Aisha with a dignified escort back to Medina. Forty of the best women of Basra seeing her off. After all, she, as with Talha and Zubair, had only intended to unify the Muslims against the mob. We only intended Islah, she remorsefully remarked to Ali. Reminiscing over Jamal would cause Aisha deep pain. She would weep bitterly until her clothing became soaked with her tears whenever she would recite the ayah. فَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَ تَبَرُّجَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ الْأُولَى وَأَقِمْنَ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتِينَ الزَّكَاةَ وَأَطِعْنَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِّرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا And stay in your homes and do not display yourselves like the times of ignorance and perform the prayer, and pay the alms, and obey Allah and His Messenger. Allah wishes only to remove evil from you, O members of the household, O family of the Prophet, and to purify you with a thorough purification. On her deathbed, Aisha asked not to be buried beside her late husband, the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, but in the burial place of the Prophet's other wives. For I did something after him that he would not be pleased with. Aisha's heartbreak, humility and utter lack of any sense of entitlement couldn't be further from the greed of the Gawgha. Ali took neither slaves nor spoils from Al-Jamal and this vexed the greedy Gawgha in his ranks. Just as their progenitor, the Khawaisra, was vexed when his men did not get their share of spoils from the Prophet, causing him to abuse Allah's Messenger, suggesting that he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, lacked justice and fear of God. Then too, it was Ali who had brought the spoils. Amazing how history repeats itself. Meanwhile, from his base at Damascus, Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan, radiallahu anhuma, had watched the fitna unfold from a safe distance. Upon Uthman's death, Muawiyah became head of the house of Banu Umayyah. As Uthman's heir, he exercised his authority in demanding qisas, retribution, for his slain kinsmen, in accordance with the ayah, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَمَنْ قُتِلَ مَظْلُومًا فَقَدْ جَعَلْنَا لِوَلِيِّهِ سُلْطَانًا فَلَا يُسْرِفْ فِي الْقَتْلِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ مَنْصُورًا And do not kill the soul that Allah has forbidden, except for a just cause. And whoever is killed, we have given his heir the authority but let him not exceed the limits in the matter of taking life. Verily, he is helped. Thus from Muawiyah's perspective, from his calm Syrian sea of social order and stability, he could not see any justifiable reason why Ali, as caliph, could not exercise his authority, as he would have surely, in executing swiftly and summarily, each and every one's of Uthman's enemy. To make matters worse, Muawiyah believed, with good reason, that the hypocrites, the mob responsible for his cousin's regicide, were amongst Ali's most fervent supporters. This did not sit right with him at all. Add to that, Ali was demanding immediate bayah from the people of Sham when he had himself delayed his bayah to Abu Bakr for six months. This was also a problem. This is why Muawiyah withheld his bayah, his pledging allegiance to Ali, until the latter brought to justice every party presumed to have played a part in Uthman's death. But Ali didn't see it like that. He didn't recognize the governor's right to defy a caliph while simultaneously refusing to relinquish control of his governor. It's not like the prophet had not said, there will be successive evils, so whoever tries to divide the affair of this ummah whilst it is united, then strike him with the sword, whoever he be. Hence Ali felt compelled to compel all of Syria to come under his command, by force of arms if necessary. And so he led his army northwestwards from Kufa into Syria encamping at Sifin on the right bank of the mighty Euphrates. That place is today associated with the village of Tal Abu Huraira, an apt name considering how Abu Huraira was one of several celebrated Sahaba reported to have questioned Muawiyah during Sifin. O Muawiyah, Abu Huraira and Abu Darda demanded to know, Why are you fighting Ali? 
while he is more deserving of this matter of Khilafa than you in virtue and in precedence of faith. Muawiyah answered, I am not claiming that I precede Ali in this matter of Khilafa, but I will fight him until he delivers to me the murderers of Uthman. Thereafter, I will be a man from the Muslims. I will enter into what the rest of the people have entered into. This is a crucial detail. Muawiyah did not rebel. He did not make khuruj against Ali. Well, he did lughatan wa shar'an, that is, according to the linguistic and shari definition of khuruj, to defy a Muslim ruler, but he could not have made khuruj istilahan, technically, as he had not given bayah to Ali. Muawiyah was challenging a ruler, but not his ruler, not no man he had sworn any allegiance to. The two sides did try to reconcile their differences, but a wicked one from the Iraqi camp representing Ali, instead of suing for peace, incited a war. He insulted Muawiyah, saying horrible things. Unsurprisingly, he would eventually reappear in the ranks of the Khawarij, opposing Ali. With neither party willing to back down, the armies gave battle on the 7th of Safar. It was an awful affair. Tens of thousands of believers were slain on both sides. More than all had died at the hands of the disbelievers since the start of the Prophet's mission. This was not jihad, it was fitna, a civil war between believers, the both sides of whom sincerely believed in their cause, their fighting for truth and justice, a reality affirmed by revelation, such as the Prophet ﷺ saying, the last hour, meaning the day of judgment, will not be established until two mighty groups will fight, there will be great casualties between them, the body count will be massive, their call however, will be won. Both Ali and Muawiyah were calling to justice. They differed only on the sequencing. Remember, Allah had similarly acknowledged the iman of both groups of Muslims who fell into fighting over what they perceived was a legitimate grievance. Then too, their call for justice was one, and then too, one group was described as transgressing. Safin was no different. Prophesizing the death of the noble companion Ammar bin Yasir at Safin, the Prophet ﷺ indicated the correctness of Ali's position on whose side and in whose ranks Ammar had been fighting. Rasulullah ﷺ يقول إن عمار بن ياسر فقتله الفئة الباغية. The God-fearing men in Muawiyah's army were all too aware of this hadith and tried to avoid any combat with Ammar. One can only imagine what a strange scene that must have been. The Prophet ﷺ's judgment upon the despicable duo, who actually delivered to Ammar the death blow and took away his head in tow, was severe even more so. قَاتْلُ عَمَّارٍ وَسَالِبُهُ فِي النَّارِ The killer of Ammar and the one who robs him are in the fire. قَتِلَ عَمَّارٌ فِي يَاسِرٌ قَتِلَ عَمَّارٌ فِي يَاسِرٌ Abdullah bin Amir bin Al-As was one of the Al-Abadilatul Arba'ah. The four famed Abdullahs of the Companions of Allah's Messenger, known for their piety and learning, from a community where there was no shortage of piety and learning. The other Abdullahs were Ibn Umar, Ibn Abbas, and Ibn Az-Zubair. Abdullah bin Amr had accompanied his father during Safin, but refused to partake in the fighting. Mali wali Safin, Mali wali qitali al-Muslimin. What has Safin to do with me? He would say. What has the killing of Muslims to do with me? Indeed, by Allah, I did not strike with the sword, and nor did I shoot an arrow. When he heard Ammar's being killed, he was shocked and immediately rushed to his father, Amr bin al-As. Amr bin al-As was a highly intelligent individual, politically savvy and shrewd to a T. He had conquered Egypt during the reign of Umar ibn al-Khattab through guile and guts, becoming its on and off governor. During Safin, he was Muawiyah's chief consul. At first, Muawiyah blamed Ali for Ammar's death, complaining that Ali should not have brought him to fight at Safin. When Ali heard this excuse, he retorted, Did the Prophet kill Hamza because he brought him to Uhud? Allah knows best, but deep down, Muawiyah must have started to doubt his position following the killing of Ammar by one of his own. His whole army, in fact, was dejected. Of course they were. Why wouldn't they be? How would any believer feel if finding himself on the wrong side of a prophecy? Muawiyah wanted an out. Amr gave him one. By the third day, 
Ali's superior numbers and generalship almost won him the day. Almost. Sensing the tide had conclusively turned against them, and feeling unnerved by the unforgivable execution of the loftiest of believers, Ammar, and the defiling of his corpse by the lowliest of their rank and file, the Levantines tied copies of the Qur'an to their lances and raised them aloft, gesturing for a truce. Arbitration over attrition. But Ali felt this to be a ruse. Bainana wa bainakum kitabullah, cried the cornered Syrians, as they recited, أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا نَصِيبًا مِنَ الْكِتَابِ يُدْعَوْنَ إِلَى كِتَابِ اللَّهِ لِيَحْكُمَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ يَتَوَلَّى فَرِيقٌ مِّنْهُمْ وَهُمْ مُعْرِضُونَ Have you not seen those who have been given a portion of scripture? They are being invited to the book of Allah to settle their dispute. Then a party of them turn away, and they are averse. Ali was less than impressed, and instead wanted to press home his advantage. This is nothing but a ploy. Forwards, continue. But there was dissension in the ranks. Many were genuinely keen to avoid any further bloodshed, while others had a distinct air of holier-than-thouness about them. Frustrated, Ali ceded and agreed to halt the hostilities and negotiate. Now, from the peacemaking party came forth a rabble in open rebellion. They had been amongst those most vociferous in suing for a ceasefire, but now decided that they had committed kufr for doing so. They became incensed with Ali and made takfir of him, declaring him a disbeliever, essentially for having accommodated them. They mutinied on the basis that it was not for me immortals to negotiate on matters of life and death, but that judgment was for none but Allah alone. was their mantra. كَلِمَةُ حَقٍّ يُرَادُ بِهَا بَاطِلٍ was Ali's counter. These were the Khawarij, now fully formed, and including in their ranks members of the mob who had collectively murdered Uthman. There will be two parties in my Ummah, the Prophet ﷺ had said. From between them will emerge a renegade, rogue element, whom the party nearer to the truth will kill. Here again, the Prophet affirmed that both the party of Ali and Muawiyah were believers, striving for the truth, and that Ali anhu, was closer to the truth, as he was to be the instrument of Allah's worldly retribution against the Khawarij. And in the mutiny of the Khawarij, we begin to appreciate the brilliance of Ali bin Abi Talib. One of the best ways to deal with a dangerous aggressive behavior is to channel it, even nurture it, to where it can be put to work for you instead of against you. This is the same thinking behind placing unruly adolescents into combat sports, into pursuits where their aggression can be spent in a controlled environment. Ali's absorbing into his military members of the mob that had besieged Uthman's home was therefore a genius move. These Rawra, these proto Khawarij, would either get busy fighting and winning Ali's wars for him, or they would die trying. Either way, it was a result, and as they were being fielded against Muawiyah's forces, then Ali was actually presenting to Uthman's heir apparent the very culprits whom he, Muawiyah, was desperate to lay his hands on anyway. And then, when the Khawarij finally came out and broke off from Ali's army, those of the mob whom Muawiyah's army failed to slay during Safin, as Ali entered Kufa, and 12,000 of them withdrew instead to Harura, they basically signaled to Ali their open hostility. This is how it went down. One day, the Khawarij of Harura happened upon Abdullah bin Khabab and his pregnant wife. Abdullah's father, Khabab bin Al-Arat, had been an early companion of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So they asked Abdullah to narrate to them a hadith, which he did. حدثني أبي عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أن فتنة تكون القاعد فيها خير من القائم والقائم فيها خير من الماشي. والماشي فيها خير من الساعي فإن أدركتك فكن عبد الله المقتول ما تقول في أبي بكر وعمر نعم أصحاب رسول الله وخلفاؤه أعز الله بهم الإسلام أولا وآخرا فما تقول في عثمان بن عفان في أول خلافته وفي آخرها كان على الحق في أولها وفي آخرها 
وما رأيك في علي بن أبي طالب قبل التحكيم وبعدها إنه أعلم بالله منكم ومني وأشد ثوقا إلى دينه وأنفذ بصيرة Nothing Abdullah bin Khabbab narrated was to their liking, so they seized him and his family. They passed by an orchard belonging to a Christian, and one of them put its fallen fruit in his mouth. The other Kharijite said, The fruit of a non-Muslim? How have you made it lawful for yourself? So he spat it out. Then they passed a pig, and one of them struck the swine with his sword. His Kharijite comrade said, A pig belonging to a non-Muslim? How have you made it lawful for you? Observing the crazies, Abdullah bin Khabab said, Shall I not tell you what is more sacred for you than this? Me, I am. The Khawarij then took their righteous captives by a river. They killed Abdullah's pregnant wife in front of him and cut out her unborn child before slaughtering him like an animal. When news reached Ali, he was livid and demanded the Khawarij hand over Abdullah's murderers. <laughs> All of us killed him, was their response. Allahu Akbar, exclaimed Ali. He had his kasa spell eye, with fire in the belly. No more were the belligerents his bodyguard bigging him up. Now they were in opposing battle lines facing him down, right where he wanted them. And even then, only after he sent Ibn Abbas to debate them, the result of which was thousands of the mutinous Khwarij counter-mutinied, most dispersing back to their homes and several hundred rejoining Ali's army whom he would then field against the remaining die-hard Khwarij, the Haruris who couldn't be convinced to switch sides. Like I said, genius move. Not for nothing did Umar say, I seek refuge in Allah from living among a people where Abu Hassan, where Ali, is not among them. Ali fought the die-hard Hururi Kharijites by the Nahrawan Canal, just outside modern-day Baghdad in central Iraq. By Allah, they won't kill but ten of you, Ali told his army and no more than ten of them will escape you. And that's just how it went down. It was a one-sided ass-whooping of prophesied proportions. If I were to reach them, the Prophet ﷺ had said about the Kharijites, I would surely slaughter them with the slaughtering of Thamud. Ali did not disappoint. The heavily outnumbered Kharijite host was decimated by the Caliph's army. Unlike Jamal and Safin, Nahrawan was not an act of civil war but holy war, a jihad. The sunnah, as we have seen through multiple miraculous prophecies, distinguishes between the khariji against whom jihad is to be fought and the baghi against whom fighting is the last resort. Ali had wept after Jamal. He stressed after Sifin. But after Nahrawan, he gave sajda in thanks for having been chosen by Allah to deliver such a splendid slaughter upon the enemies of Islam. Once again, Ali found himself on the right side of a prophecy. Allah's Messenger وسلم, had told him that he would do battle with the Khwarij and that among them he would find Dhuthadayya, a demon with a deformity on his shoulder in the likeness of a woman's breast. When the Muslims found his corpse amongst piled up mounds of dead Kharijites, Ali remarked, Sadaqa, huwa min al jan He, the Prophet, spoke the truth, and he, the Thadayya was of the jinn. Now, the crushing of the Kharijite combatants at Nahrawan left their surviving comrades seething. They swore vengeance and hatched a plot to do away with Ali, Muawiyah and Amr bin al-As. They missed their mark with the latter two companions, but not with Ali. He, radiallahu anhu, took the full brunt of a Kharijite assassin's poison sword strike to his crown during the Fajr prayer at the Grand Mosque in Kufa. Ali, the first youth to embrace Islam at the hands of his cousin, the Prophet, died a martyr age 63, the same age of the passing of the Prophet, alayhim as Hassan bin Ali, the grandson of the Prophet, became caliph almost by default, not unlike his father had, following the murder of his predecessor, Uthman. <laughs> صلاتكم عباد الله يقول لكم أمير المؤمنين لا تفوتوا صلاتكم صلاتكم As Ali's executor, Hassan set out to conclude his father's unfinished business. He led a huge army towards Syria. 
Muawiyah and his men came out to meet them. And then something amazing and quite unexpected happened. When Amr bin al-As saw Hassan's army approach, a mountain in motion as he described it, he said to Muawiyah, I surely see battalions which will not turn back before killing their opponents. Muawiyah replied to him, O Amr, if these kill those and those kill these, who will be left with me to manage the people? Who will be left with me to protect their women and children? So Muawiyah sent two Qurayshi men to Hassan, saying to them, Go to this man and negotiate peace with him, and talk and appeal to him. Whatever Hassan asked of them, they gave their guarantee, and thus with Muawiyah was concluded a permanent peace treaty. When Hassan had been a child, the Prophet ﷺ ascended the pulpit with him and declared, In ibn hadha Sayyid, indeed this son of mine is a master, a leader and perhaps Allah will reconcile through him two mighty groups of Muslims. Hassan made good his grandfather's words and abdicated the leadership of the Ummah to Muawiyah. The two parties became one. The Quranic directive was actualized as reconciliation between the believers was, at long last, realized. <laughs> Thus came to an end the great fitna, the first civil war in Islam. The main takeaway from the tragedy, besides the amazing accuracy of the plethora of prophecies evidencing Muhammad truly was a true prophet of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, besides that, the main takeaway is the sorrow the Sahaba experienced during the whole episode, as they expressed in their own grief-stricken words. Because that's how we're supposed to react to fitna. Bank that sentiment, that melancholy mood. It will become relevant when we contrast it with the smugness of those who shamelessly try and draw inspiration from the trials of the companions of Allah's Messenger, where there is none to be drawn. So be careful, O Muslim, when you feel the need to look into the terrible trial that overtook a generation honoured by all but a crook, and who included those whose death had the throne of Allah shook. Men and women of noble souls, praised by Allah in His noble book. لا تجد قوم يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر يوادون من حد الله ورسوله ولو كانوا آباءهم أو أبناءهم أو إخوانهم أو عشيرتهم أولئك كتب في قلوبهم الإيمان وأيدهم بروح منه ويدخلهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه أولئك حزب الله Allah in Hizballahi Humul Muflihu.